Hello Vinyl Community! It's been a very long time since my last VC video and uh, as usual there might be all kind of reasons for that. Mostly uh, a month ago I uh, started to take care of my father who is quite old now and uh, I also inherited his uh, giant uh, uh, little uh, exhausting uh, dog. So I'm I'm a kind of a dog owner now, which I never wanted to be, but um, yeah, those are the burdens and uh, duties. And uh, so um, I never got around to make a VC video. And uh, I mean, you, obvi you obviously need a certain kind of uh, mood and spare time to do that. But uh, it certainly did not stop me from uh, listening to all kind of great music uh, and occasionally uh, to, uh, to, to, to buy, to purchase uh, more records. Um, no, actually the whole dog thing is not that bad for my uh, musical uh, endeavors. Simply because I spend a lot of time uh, walking uh, with this with the dog around the country here, oftentimes like two, even three hours a day, and uh, obviously I this gives me the opportunity to listen to a lot of music, and uh, that's what I do. So uh, let's have a look at some uh, records. Uh, some of them just stuff that I've been listening to in the last days, but also. Uh, handful of uh, new purchases. So uh, first of all this one this is uh, really brand new. Um, this is uh, a EP called uh, Crocodile by the German electronic experimental project BELP. Um, this is already the third record I have by BELP and I find it quite interesting that uh, uh, while the music is clearly rooted in sort of a electro slash uh, dub step, uh, even in parts sort of a techno music, uh, it's always changing a little bit from album to album. So there is most certainly a kind of a personal musical development uh, behind every album. And uh, there are a lot of elements of industrial that you can hear and uh, a touch of ambient and it's all kind of a mixed into a really a into a sound that is pretty much free of any kind of genre. I mean if you look if you look at the records created by Belp uh, like on Discogs then uh, you see that people uh, made an effort to add any kind of genre style to this music but uh, it always fails a little bit i mean this, this is not a this is not a dubstep album it's certainly not a techno album or something like that it's a little too thought provoking to be just a techno or electro album um it's in in parts it's pretty challenging Simply because uh, I think the artists behind it just don't want to confirm uh, or to 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 uh, submit himself to uh, musical cliches. So uh, yeah, it's in parts it's very original music, uh, very intriguing, and uh, that's something you actually don't hear that much in this time and age where most of the music is rather based on stereotypes and cliches and uh, uh, kind of embracing uh, beaten tracks that uh, um, offer nothing particularly new. So this is very different. So I kind of understand why Belp is uh, always uh, kind of provoking, provoking your, your hearing because it's about exploring uh, new ideas and push the envelope a little bit. So I kind of, for me, for me personally, I kind of would file this under avant-garde music. But I can understand that avant-garde is not a term that a band would be throwing around a lot in this time and age. Because it's probably very bad for a... 
for your <laughs> public uh, for your public image as far as um, as uh, record sales go because uh, if you say this is avant-garde then nobody wants to have to do anything to do with it but um, if you're looking for something that is uh, really a different cup of tea that is uh, really away from any kind of uh, beaten musical track uh, then this is a good choice I think this album here is brand new this has been released like basically r right now I think and uh, yeah it's it's an interesting it's an interesting exploration uh, particularly um, if you listen to the other albums and kind of discover a certain evolution uh, behind this music uh, it's not a, it's not a kind of sound you would be listening to every day probably uh, maybe it's a little bit too disturbing for that but uh, if you pride yourself uh, with uh, being someone uh, looking for new sounds and new ideas and stuff that is far away from uh, the usual, then uh, this could be an interesting endeavor. So, uh, Crocodile by Belp, uh, hot out of the press right now, so to speak. Yeah, um... Then I bought two records that I have been waiting for for quite a while, waiting for uh, a reissue uh, because those two albums are from the year 1981 and uh, obviously uh, those are the kind of albums that uh, have been offered for a lot of money on Discogs and so I always shied away from uh, uh, spending uh, that much hard-earned cash for records, for second-hand records. I mean, particularly because this is stuff from Japan, so uh, yeah, uh, this is the kind of uh, album where you you had to pay like 100, 150 dollars somewhere to some guy in Russia or Tokyo <laughs> to get a hold of it, so I was very happy that this got re-released and uh, I'm talking about the McVaju Ensemble so this is this was their first album. Let me turn it in a way that it doesn't reflect the light too much. So uh, McVaju Ensemble is has been a sh rather short-lived uh, group of Japanese percussionists around uh, Midori Takada. Um, I don't know if you if you follow my channel, then maybe you came across uh, one or two videos I made about Midori Takada. Um, so uh, about the records she made in the late 80s or early 90s but uh, this is 1981 and so basically uh, this is a group of Japanese uh, drummers and percussionists that kind of try to um, uh, try to that kind of try to explore the world of well mostly African percussive music Afrobeat music, so that's what it is about. Those are all just instrumentals and basically almost entirely percussive tracks, but with a lot of um, xylophones, glockenspiels, vibraphones. So there is also this kind of a percussive instruments that are a little bit more melodic, and there is always the occasional sort of a synthesizer sound in the background a little bit. Um, yeah, it's pretty nice um, to have it now on vinyl, finally, for a reasonable price. So that's why I'm a big fan of, well, uh, strategically placed reissues. Um, I'm always happy to buy those records, particularly when I've been looking at some thumbnails of these albums for years and never uh, never willing to spend so much money to buy them. So I'm kind of happy that suddenly it's possible. Um, so uh, this here is uh, this here is uh, their second album pointly called McVaju by McVaju Ensemble. They released this album in the same year just about six or seven months later 
Um, I think those two are their only albums they ever did in 1981. Uh, and um, probably the one interesting thing about this record additionally is that uh, this was produced and uh, basically uh, composed by Joe Hisaishi. Now, Joe Hisaishi is a very famous Japanese uh, composer and producer, mostly known for his uh, film soundtracks. Um, so he did, for example, a soundtrack to, a, to the Takeshi Kitano movie called Hanabi, which is a very well-known and very well-received soundtrack. So here he basically managed uh, the McQuadro Ensemble for a record, for one, for a... Uh, one project and um, I actually prefer this one uh, to the to the uh, to the first one to the key motion record I mean they're both great don't get me wrong but um, uh, there's something I think this one is better better engineered slightly I would say uh, it certainly makes the use of uh, sort of a stereo space a little better I think um, but um, obviously those are two great albums that uh, are quite similar in, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, sound and uh, musical ideas. So that's uh, Makwaju Ensemble, a Japanese band from the very early 80s, uh, completely uh, immersed in African music. Yeah, also... Um, those two records, I would personally, uh, in terms of genre, I wouldn't call this world music, because for me it doesn't feel like world music. I would place this much deeper into the genre of so-called fourth world uh, sound, or fourth world music, which is this one term coined by, uh, by John Hassel. If you remember this uh, famous John Hassel and Brian Eno album. Um, so... Um, since then, there is this idea of fourth world music, which is something uh, very particular about it in terms of uh, musical expression and sound. So it's always some music that has some kind of uh, ethnographic uh, relation to particular cultures, but can never be pinned down as some kind of a world music or ethnic music. So it's more... It's more like a ethnographic dream created that way, but it can never be precisely pinned down to a particular culture, and it shouldn't be. Another example of a fourth world music would be, for example, the the British uh, ambient uh, project Oyukai Conjugate. Those, their music is very fourth world, and the same could be said about the Passion album by Peter Gabriel, very fourth world. So this is kind of a red thread that uh, you can kind of follow through the musical history and uh, it's not a very it's a very loose term fourth world music but uh, i always felt it's pretty pretty fitting in terms of uh, mcwaji ensemble so uh, that's about it and uh, let's continue with two other purchases i made so first this is uh, Obviously, the famous uh, debut album by the wonderful Haruomi Hosono, uh, titled Hosono House. Now, this is uh, 1973, his first record. Uh, this is a re-release uh, by uh, Light in the Attic and uh, caused quite some attention last autumn when they announced this huge re-release uh, program of uh, all the 70s Hosono records, or not all of them, but most of them. I'm certainly one of those people that have been waiting for this kind of re-release for probably years. Uh, it, the same like the McWaju Ensemble records, I mean the Hosono records were always available, available on Discogs for crazy amounts of money, I mean like 100, 200 euro dollars or whatever. And so I've always been waiting for somebody to pick it up and re-release it because I thought this is an opportunity. Someone can really make some successful uh, vinyl productions with this music because I'm pretty sure around the world there are so many people just waiting for it to happen. So it took some years and suddenly there was this announcement 
but um, I don't know. I think I think I would have because they immediately announced to re-release like five to six Hosono albums at the same time, which meant that probably for budgetary reasons uh, the amount of printed records was rather limited. I would say. So um, I would have preferred for them to kind of bring out, for example, two albums first, then another two albums maybe three months later, and then another two albums another three months later. This would have been, first of all, a little more kind to to people's wallets. That's one point. Um, because when this came out, six albums at once, you just kind of had to go and plunder your bank account because uh, you knew that this will be sold out within days or weeks, which is exactly what happened. Um, so um, this was kind of a off-putting. I really didn't like the way this was handled, simply because uh, you couldn't directly order from uh, Light in the Attics. They just didn't deliver to Europe, only in North America. So you kind of had to wait until it all trickled down to the, for example, here to the German record stores and then you kind of could catch it. But uh, I mean, the the more you had to wait for this to happen, the smaller the amount of records available. So in the end, I had no chance. I mean, I had no chance just to put that kind of money on the table right away. So um, this will turn out to be what it is usually with me that over time I will kind of manage to get those uh, records a little overpriced probably. I mean even right now those that are sold out and they've been sold out after like two or three weeks this was over basically. And uh, so those records you can kind of find them now for 60, 70 to 80 dollars. So that's what I will have to do probably when I have $80 lying around. And um, so anyway, what I managed to get was the, the first album, the the charming Hosanna House record, and uh, also the quite uh, experimental and quite astounding Cochin Moon. Cochin Moon is a wonderful record for those who like uh, experimental electronic music of the 70s. Um, this is quite a fascinating programmatic idea for a record. Um, I mean, Hosono sp had spent some time in India with a bunch of buddies uh, hanging around there, living on a boat and uh, kind of immersing themselves into this uh, um, culture that uh, was quite uh, foreign and exotic to them. And so... Um, in the end, he made an album about it, but uh, while the album makes sort of an effort to replicate uh, in a musical way the atmosphere of 70s India, um, the task was to do it entirely with uh, the back then contemporary synthesizer gadgets. So it's a fully fledged electronic album that uh, in a quite a charming and fascinating ways manages to to capture the atmosphere of India in the 70s. So if I mean this is really a high concept album so to speak and uh, quite an achievement. It's quite fascinating and um, if you are into sort of 70s synthesizer music um, this can kind of blow you away. Um, of course it has to be said that Light in the Attic really did a great job with uh, the whole package. Um, this all has been made into a, um, a gatefold sleeve uh, record with a lot of text. There is a whole big booklet with uh, a lot of liner notes inside of it. I can just show you. So uh, this is here. There's obviously a huge interview with Harumi Hosono, some photographs. So yeah, this is, once you own it, you are pretty happy with it. Uh, it's just uh, the path to the ownership of these records has not been made particularly easy by Light in the Attic. And um, so uh, 
it's a little tough to 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 purchase for someone like me but uh, regarding the other albums and there are still like two records i would uh, like to have from uh, this uh, release uh, program um i am not giving up the hope that they will put out a second edition maybe this year because i looked at their other records and re-releases of rather famous or infamous albums and they sometimes do that i mean they do this first wave which is a bit hysterical as i have described and uh, but then like 12 months later or six months later another batch is coming out and that's usually a little bit easier uh, to get so i'm not giving up hope so yeah so those are the two wonderful albums by haromi hosono the second one um this came out originally on king records uh, in 1978 so this is also kind of uh, hosono uh in those days when yellow magic orchestra started at the same time so it's an interesting uh point in time uh, for this kind of music yeah let's talk about uh, some other records uh, oh yeah <laughs> now, this is another interesting story so um, yeah so that happened the new Dead Can Dance album came out last autumn um, yeah another interesting story as far as uh, purchase goes so I was one of those suckers that um, kind of uh, how do you call it uh, uh, pre-ordered the album basically the same hour when uh, the pre-order was announced so what you do is you pay something and then you wait like a month or two um, until uh, the whole thing is released and then you kind of get it I think there is a certain idea behind it that uh, technically you would probably get it like I don't know three four days earlier than uh, the rest of the world or um, at least a pre-order is kind of a way to make sure that something that's rather rare is not being sold out uh, in front of your eyes so you kind of pre-order uh, well this complete this was a complete uh, disaster in my case <laughs> because because just my package just didn't arrive and uh, so I started a whole um, investigation where just where the parcel is and this went through the post office and uh, so uh, in the end like 10 days later I finally got it in my hands uh, after it went through a lot of places as I found out but uh, all right so in the end I got it but um, what I found a little bit uh, because uh, of course this is not the this is not the usual uh, this is not the the general release which is just basically a record in the record sleeve this was this sort of a special edition with the giant booklet and uh, and uh, record in colored vinyl and stuff like that um, yeah I mean what can I say? I mean, if you if I looked into Amazon in those days when I was sitting there waiting for my parcels, and I could see the special edition on Amazon for basically exactly the same price, even a couple of bucks cheaper. So I was thinking, why the hell did I pre-order it? Why didn't I just go to Amazon and buy it? But um, yeah, that's those are the sometimes the bad experiences you make. But uh, let's talk about the album because a lot of people expressed uh, some kind of a well a slight disappointment about the record particularly I remember James um, who is another vinyl uh, community community uh, video maker who like me is uh, really a heartfelt that can dance and Brendan Perry fan and he was very critical about the record particularly expressing uh, certain discontent about the fact that it seems to have uh, only very little of of, of Lisa Gerard on it, uh, the other half of Death Can Dance, and it kind of feels like uh, like Brandon Perry just uh, created some sort of a solo album and just kind of sold this to us as a Death Can Dance album. I kind of 
picked up Anastasis, their previous album by Dead Can Dance, and kind of started to listen to it just to compare it. Um, yeah, I can understand where this critique is coming from, and, and it's a point that could be made. Now, it is true that uh, it's not very well described on the record just uh, who plays who and why and where and so. So uh, the, it's kind of a very poor on liner notes and uh, that alone makes it uh, look a little bit suspicious. Um, I mean, if you go through the Death Can Dance catalog, um, they were never m too much into sharing information about their uh, kind of what's happening behind the curtains, just who is responsible for what. It was always kept a little bit uh, kind of short and that's not much different here. But um, this here is even more mysterious, particularly because I'm all the time I'm convinced I'm hearing all kind of passages sung by um, Le Mystère des Voix Bulgaires. Uh, which is this famous Bulgarian uh, vocal group and um, people keep saying that. I mean, I read in all kind of reviews, I keep reading about um, them being uh, involved in this project, but uh, there's not a word about it in the liner notes, so it's, it's a bit mysterious. Um, I can understand why um, some people are a little bit disappointed with this record, because uh, it starts with the A side that is basically almost completely instrumental. That's a little unusual. I mean, most of the Dead Can Dance, Dead Can Dance always had long and 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 a lot of uh, instrumental tracks, um, but they had a lot of mostly vocal oriented music, and uh, so this is a bit of a surprise. But I am not that critical about it. So I, I right now I've just kind of described how certain people feel about it or where the disappointment may come from. Um, I get it. I I don't entirely share it. I just I think it's always interesting for a project that keeps evolving just to try to create uh, new avenues, just to open different doors. Um, I know people usually don't like it. We are all made that way. We, if you have a, if you have your favorite album from a band, you kind of feel like hopefully the next album is more like that, because that's when I like the most. And uh, but um, it would be it would be obviously uh, quite illusional. It would be an illusion to to expect Brandon and Lisa now to create a record that kind of sounds like. Uh, Within the realm of a dying sun or Aeon, those were different days. That's all kind of twenty years ago. So, um, well, twenty actually thirty. <laughs> Not to put too much of a point on that. Um, so, um, I really like this record because I think it's taking a bit of a different journey than uh, the previous record, so um, I'm not sure if uh, Dead Can Dance should keep sounding like that. Uh, that's probably not such a good idea, but I find it very interesting to create an album like that. So this is, again, a lot of uh, fourth world music. Um, I mean, the cues kind of come from mostly an Arabic, Arabic uh, or m sort of a Middle Eastern uh, musical environment. Um, but there is also a lot of uh, efforts to kind of explore how music might have sounded uh, 3,000 years ago in uh, in the Aegeus, in, in, in Greece. And um, so it's I find it very intriguing. Um, in the end, there is Lisa Gerard singing on it. There is, there is, there is Brendan Perry singing on it. Um, most of it you find on the B-side. Um, yeah, so it's the album is called Dionysus. I I think I didn't mention that, um, and uh, it's uh, it's divided into two acts, Act One and Act Two, and uh, so it's a bit of a program album, you could say, or concept album, um, and uh, yeah, I find it very fascinating. Um, it's obviously the kind of music that has been com entirely created on a computer. Um, this is uh, 
something that you kind of can hear. Um, so it has a certain drive and dynamic and uh, it's almost... In parts, it's almost uh, in the direction of uh, sort of a, uh, yeah, how to, how to call it, a, a kind of a dance music. I mean, it's probably something you could play in some in some hot dance club in, in Lebanon or somewhere. Um, it could be pretty popular there. So, um, yeah, I, I like this record. Personally, I don't share the critical voices. I think over time this will grow on people and uh, certainly become a lot, another landmark by Dead Can Dance. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say I was disappointed. I was I was disappointed by the purchasing process again. <laughs> just had I just had a streak of bad luck with those things uh, lately. But um, musically, I was intrigued. I. I was glad that uh, it's something completely different than uh, than uh, Anastasis, um, and uh, I certainly hope this is not their last album. And um, I'm pretty sure the next one will be pretty different again. Um, so uh, so uh, don't give up on this record. Just give it a try, and uh, keep an open mind. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean the thing. The thing is, um, I think if when people say there is not enough Lisa Gerard on it singing, um, and that's a bit suspicious, I hear you. But um, to say that kind of has a tendency to reduce Lisa Gerard as sort of the the female singer of Dead Can Dance, which is she's not. I mean, there's a lot of instrumental music in the catalogue of Dead Can Dance that was written or co-written by Lisa Gerard. So um so it's a bit it's a bit difficult to to support uh such a claim. Um they're both singing much less on this record. They're all kind of a vocal sampling uh, or kind of a sort of Arabic voices. There is uh there are a lot of interesting choir moments that kinda feel like those are the Bulgarian voices, um, even though I just don't understand why you can't find it in the liner notes or anything about it. Um, particularly because Lisa Gerard just uh, released uh, music with Le, Voix, Le Mystère des Voix Bulgares. Uh, so um, there is obviously a kind of a connection and she kind of brought them into the project. But um, I think just because there is less singing by Lisa on this record, that doesn't necessarily mean that she wasn't involved. Um, it's just an album that is much more instrumental than the other Dead Can Dance albums. Uh, and, um, but I don't regard Dead Can Dance as a purely vocalist band and once it's not too vocalist anymore there's something wrong with it or something like that i don't think in that way so um so i would like that even if they one day made an entirely in instrumental album without <laughs> without one uh, one vocal track on it i would still be intrigued and try to understand what it is all about so that's that. Um, um, the other thing is, uh, in hindsight, I'm not particularly sure if this was a good decision to get the the special edition. I mean, it's 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 this sort of a big uh, thing uh, with the uh, with the CD inside. Now well, that's nice. Uh, so I can make my own MP3s from that, and of course you have the colored vinyl record here. But um, uh, was it worth it, or should I just have bought the the individual, the the, the, the general uh, vinyl record? I don't know. Um, in hindsight, um, I'm kind of happy to have this record here in this in this edition. But uh, um, in the end, the result is not that exciting. Uh, I've probably hoped to find a little more text inside uh, this giant booklet um, but in the end it's basically just a, a sequence of giant photographs but it's okay I certainly like the album so let's go 
What else? Yeah, let's check out some some uh, purchases along the road. So what about this one? An instant classic uh, short stories by John and Vangelis. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a neat uh, album. I think this was the first one that uh, uh, John Anderson and Vangelis did together. Uh, yeah, I mean, these two guys, they kind of found each other because uh, Vangelis' sounds and John Anderson's voice are pretty good match for music. Um, I mean, you have to take all the cheesiness into account, which they're both pretty good at. Um, so particularly not music I would listen to every day, but uh, it's kind of nice. I just saw this edition in a really good shape, so I just couldn't say no. Expanding my um, Vangelis, my never-ending Vangelis collection, my never-ending John Anderson collection. So it's a nice crossroad um, between these two guys. So the next record I bought is Insides Out by Hamilton Bohannon. Of course, Hamilton Bohannon was uh, in the mid-70s uh, quite a influential disco producer and uh, this album is no exception. This is pretty great uh, mid-70s disco sound. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure some hip-hop artists and some techno artists of the 90s sampled the shit out of this record and uh, they knew why. Um, so this is a great disco record. I really like that sound, that original sort of first generation disco sound. And uh, Bohannon is certainly uh, one of the big names uh, in that particular genre. Yeah, since I'm kind of always collecting anything that come that I come across from Joe Jackson, it was overdue that I get. Uh, Mike's Murder, his, uh, one of his soundtrack works. Um, it's uh, uh, Joe Jackson in the middle of his sort of swinging, jazzy New York face. So um, it's exactly as you would expect. It's a good sounding record with some fantastic uh, grooves. Um, sort of uh, an album for a collector of Joe Jackson stuff. It's obviously not uh, as significant as uh, some of his major records like Body and Soul or Night and Day, but uh, yeah, I like it. I, of course, could not say no. So, um, yeah, those records I did not purchase now, I just listened to them, so I kept them out of the shelf, already intending to make this video. Um, those are the two albums by the Bransky Beat. First, The Magnificent, The Age of Consent. Uh, for me, a very uh, revolutionary album, uh, uh, fascinating songwriting, great sound, and uh, certainly one of the most important records of the 80s, in my opinion. Um, great electro-pop album, obviously with uh, Jimmy Somerville on the vocals. Um, yeah, Bronski Beat did only two records, uh, and he sings only on the first one. The second one, less known, uh, Truth Dare, Double Dare, uh, with the replacement vocalist, uh, which was uh, John John. Yeah, really, his name John John. I mean, it sounds like a, it's kind of a DC comic hero, um, <laughs> and uh, which is probably intentional. But I think it's a bit of an underrated album. Um, it's, it's quite good. I really like the sound of this record, and uh, I think he's, uh, John John is really a fantastic singer. Um, it's a bit of a shame that this has never been developed any further, And um, but the advantage of this is that you just have to buy two albums and you have the complete uh, catalogue of the whole band. <laughs> I like that. I have a whole bunch of uh, bands that re released only two albums, right? I mean, there is like Frankie Goes to Hollywood, two records. Uh, Yazoo, two records. There is, of course, this swarm of kind of 
collectible 12 inches around it, particularly around uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, uh, but also Yazoo. So when I see them, I kind of buy those 12 inches as well. It's quite fun because you can get them cheap. But uh, it's interesting. Uh, there are these bands that have only two albums. So, um, now finally before I close here, um, um, let's get to some uh, more cerebral music. And I'm talking obviously about Alan Holdsworth. And uh, I'm a big fan of Alan Holdsworth and uh, proud to have basically all of his records. This is uh, one of my favorite Metal Fatigue. Um, well, what can I say about Mr. Holdsworth that, that has not been said by many other. Um, so great, uh, great, uh, intense uh, guitar playing, uh, a lot of uh, fascinating uh, legato style solos that uh, are really uh, intense and um, particularly um, if, if people say they want to listen to something new or something interesting or something that's uh, apart from the norm, then uh, this too is a good address because um, Holdsworth always managed to create uh, sounds and harmonies that are kind of different. And it's not about being uh, kind of a cacophonic or discord, in discord, but... Uh, those are just very outlandish harmonies, but once you get on board with that, it's it's not an unpleasant listen. Certainly, it's it's a, uh, it's just um, it just you hear just uh, kind of a harmonic progressions and and moods that that come along with it that are quite different than uh, the rest of the rock and pop genre. Um, and I think Alan Holdsworth always uh, took a lot of time to figure those those uh, new pathways for harmonic uh, sequences and for for uh, scales, uh, and and so so he created this whole Holdsworth universe, you could say, which is a kind of a which is a musical world. Of itself because it just sounds like nothing else sounds you can particularly hear this on this album certainly one of my favorite sand um, sand is really like music from a different planet but at the same time so beautifully rooted in, uh, in jazz fusion and progressive rock and uh, it's a very fascinating journey I mean if, if you want to listen to something that's just different and yet not different through pure noise or just different through being just somehow exhausting it's different just by its own subtlety and that's very fascinating it's a great album uh, very unique sound it's all the whole album sounds like it's kind of made of glass if you ask me which is interesting because there's a kind of a chemical connection between sand and glass but um, yeah glass is what always comes to mind when I listen to this album uh, the choice of, of, of guitar sounds and uh, obviously this is uh, one of the three big uh, synth X albums that Alan Holdsworth recorded using this uh, really strange instrument I have seen back in the 80s the synth X only I think played by Gary Moore. I think Gary Moore played a little bit the synth X. You can see him playing it in some 80s music videos. But um, obviously no one uh, made such an immersive and intense use of the synth X than more than Alan Holdsworth. And finally, um, I was listening to Secrets by Alan Holdsworth. Um, at this point in time, probably my favorite uh, Holdsworth album right now, but this keep changing every six months. Um, for many years, Sand was certainly my favorite, but kind of Secrets kind of grown on me. Um, it's I think Secrets wouldn't be a wrong album for someone to get into the music of Alan Holdsworth. It would be an interesting entry album. It has uh, certainly all the properties of uh, Alan Holdsworth record, but... Uh, it has some very, very 
soft spoken tracks on it and some interesting melodic almost sort of dreamy pop songs but um, obviously uh, all uh, um, intertwined with uh, this uh, marvelous fascinating guitar music um, so yeah that's the last record for today Secrets uh, by Alan Holdsworth. I think an album that came out like very late 80s. Uh, yes, 1989. Wonderful record. So that's it. I've been rambling a lot, but um, remember for me, uh, making a VC video is uh, at this point in time the only, the only way to um, exercise my English a little bit. So have a nice day, keep it spinning and uh, see you next time.